Welcome to the American Classroom Podcast. I'm Jared Taylor. I'm here with my host, Lindsay Croslin. We're here today to talk to Jeff Burrell about science education and specifically robotics. But before we do that, we'd like to just hear a little bit about, about your background. Um, you've been teaching for a couple of years now, right? Oh, yeah, about 30 now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. Why did you get into science and education? And tell us a little bit about well, your Well, the journey. funny thing was I didn't start out college to become a teacher. When my high school guidance counselor said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I honestly told her, rich. <laughs> I'd never yeah. been that before. My dad was a school teacher, and I love my dad. I respect everything he did about uh-huh. teaching. But we scraped by in a lot of ways. He would build the houses we lived in. My mom would make our clothes sometimes even. And back in the 80s, there was nobody called an IT person. But I got an interest in what that would become someday. Okay. I want to do computers. And they said, well, we'll do electrical engineering with an emphasis in computers. And what do you want to do with them? I said, I don't know, build them, program them, fix them, whatever. And I was headed down that route and um, met the woman of my dreams. We got married. She was a school teacher. My wife is a school teacher. Oh. And as school teachers do, they check on people's grades. And she looked at my grades one semester Uh-oh. and said, how come you're flunking your core classes? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I kind of do better with managing my time. And she goes, no, wait, your friends come over for help and they're getting A's. I know you know this stuff. Have you considered becoming a teacher? And I oh. said, well, Okay, I love teaching. Like I said, my dad's a teacher. His mom was a teacher. One of my favorite uncles on my mom's side of the family is a teacher. I married a teacher. Yeah, teaching is awesome. But I kind of promised you a better life. I, I, you know, we, we're, we're not going to be rich. But <laughs> I, we had a, she said, but you're doing it now for free. I'm going to flunk out of college because of it, which is funny. So I looked at it, and I realized I did love teaching. I was doing it naturally as my friends asked for help. So I switched, and the funny thing was, when I looked at the field of education back in those days, and maybe still now, it's been a while, you have a major, you have a degree in education, but you have a second major, which doesn't count as a second major, and you have to pick a field. And I picked math and science because that was interesting to me. And the good part was all of my engineering core that I've been taking transferred the credits straight into my math and physics focus for my secondary oh. education degree. I didn't lose any credits. Yeah. It took me an extra year. It took five years to get a four-year degree. But yeah. I got a master's degree from a place in Florida. But good. Um, that got me an education. Well, Jeff, you have a reputation of being incredibly creative. You know, your labs are very exciting. But one of the things that people like to take your class for is robotics. Okay. Let's talk about robotics a little bit. That's a fun thing. Robotics was almost science fiction when I was a kid. So to get to deal with it now is really satisfying. Um, One of the reasons I like it as a teacher, though, is because it helps my students do something they don't seem to do anywhere else. Critical thinking is an an essential life skill. Mm -hmm. And when I think about the things that matter for education, and I work at Heritage Academy and have for a long time, and one of the core principles of heritage admission statement is to build strong citizens and to strengthen a community and families through building strong character in people Mm -hmm. and i think part of that is being hard to fool Mm -hmm. if we have strong citizens they're going to vote they're going to make decisions that affect their community Mm -hmm. and i see my job as a science teacher is to help them become good decision makers Mm -hmm. and i think robotics helps with that Mm -hmm. when i teach robotics at first we don't get to play with the robotics toys. First of all, the toys are amazing. Physics teachers have the coolest toys of all the teachers. <laughs> and I'm true. one of the people on campus that, that has the true. most storage space of anybody. Because you need those equipment. you got to have a place for the bowling balls and the umbrellas. and the well, Anyway, all this stuff. And the robot kits. When I start the robotics class out, I have them do something simple like, tell me how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Oh, fun. <laughs> and that sounds so simple, but when you pretend that you're a robot who can only follow directions exactly the way they have delivered, Telling someone to go to the kitchen and get the bread out of the cupboard and open up the peanut butter and use a knife the right way, that's complicated stuff. And with modern AI, which is supposedly smarter than original stuff, it's not really. It's just been learning for generations how to tell machines what to do. This is not as much fun of an assignment as it used to be, but I would have them give me their recipe and I would stand in front of the class with a loaf of bread inside the wrapper and a jar of peanut butter, jar of jelly. And they'd say, grab the bread and put the peanut butter on it. So I'd grab the jar of peanut butter and slam it on the loaf of bread and crunch it in the middle. And no, 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 Mr. Burrell, that's not what we meant. Well, that's what you said. And we would refine that process down to a clear list of steps, which is surprisingly hard to do for a teenager who's eaten millions of sandwiches in their lives. Right. 
but thinking about those steps. Then when they got done with that, I would say, okay, teach me how to play tic-tac-toe. Oh, oh you boy. can't even make a sandwich. <laughs> tic-tac-toe is a simple game. It's so simple. Little kids learn it. At our age, it's almost not a game anymore. It's just once you learn the tricky triangle. Yeah. You've introduced decision-making. Yeah. That's but a whole other level. to teach a computer how to recognize all the possibilities yeah. on a tic-tac-toe board and then choose which one to use next, that's something to think about. So once we get through those activities, then we get the machines out. And... To make a robot work, you've got to understand how machines work, which goes back to the physics stuff. Simple machines are levers and wheels and axles, but then there's energy that you put into it, physical energy to make the motors turn, but there's the energy that the, the builder puts into it, where they start to think about, what do I want this to do? And if they don't have a task to complete, it's just a toy. But when there's a task, then it's a really useful thing. And that's one of the reasons it's so important to have that kind of teaching in education today. We need people who will solve problems innovatively. Yep. And that goes as back as 9-11. I was teaching the day that that happened. And here in Arizona, because of the time difference, I was already on my way to school when the planes hit the building and all the tragedy was starting to be broadcast. I had so many questions from my students about what's going on, what will happen with the building. Wow. And because I had been teaching the way I've been teaching in physics, they, they expected me to have some answers that I didn't know, but I was able to finally practice what I always told them. Take the things you do know and let's analyze the principles of truth and see what's going on. Um, when I went home that night and was thinking about it, I had to admit that even as nefarious as the plans of the attackers were, there was a sick kind of genius to it. And I said, we need smart geniuses that are good guys. We need to be able to have someone who can be as innovative as that. Yeah. And I hate to people think yeah. that I spend time thinking like a terrorist. I don't, but I ha you have to be able to outthink that yeah. to prevent that or to resolve that in the future. And so in a robotics class, if you can get those machines, those pile of Legos and a little bit of a battery power and some coding to do something that's never been done before, that's a life skill that will help someone thwart a terrorist or cure a disease or something else we haven't even realized is a problem that they'll find a solution for. We have these Waymo cars that can drive without a driver now that have been through tons of testing and they had to be trained by yeah. humans how to make decisions and humans had to figure out what's the information that vehicle actually needs to be input so that the output of safe travel of a human in traffic with other crazy people making their decisions is a constantly deliverable output. Well, and imagine, so even if these students are only taking this one robotics class yeah. and they don't continue in a, you know, with robotics. I think the importance of learning, you're teaching them instructions, like detailed instructions are so important, step-by-step -step instructions. Yeah. And how critical it is to doing something, even just making a peanut butter sandwich or programming a Waymo car, right? Uh, which someone's life is in that moving yeah. vehicle. <laughs> and so just understanding whether you're a surgeon or whether you're a programmer or whatever career, like being able to follow instructions and create detailed instructions for someone is, like you said, a life skill. Yeah, an, an essential life skill. Life skill yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, it's really, you say some of them don't go anywhere past that. And some of them didn't. They did some crazy things. Some of the coolest experiences I had in robotics class were ideas that the, the kids came up with that I hadn't even considered. We entered a competition when there was a small league of charter schools that would compete together. And... We frustrated the judges more than once because at the first competition, our guys didn't just make the fastest robot for the racetrack. It was so fast that it screamed across the racetrack and knocked over the bounders. Oh. <laughs> and they said, now wait a minute. And it's because I had a boy who was so interested in how the gears worked yeah. that he spent two days in two class periods wow. trying to increase the gear ratio from his little Lego motor as many times as he could. And he... Boy, if he could oh, do that wow. to a bicycle, that kid could probably wow. ride a bicycle at 35 miles an hour if he had the same stuff geared up to human size. Wow. So when he put it on the race car for the competition, it literally burst the boundaries of it. Oh, and wow. wow. That was the beginning of what I saw the students do in my class. Um, one of it was a more static thing. We were building the tallest Lego tower you could mm -hmm. in a fixed period of time. They had two or three hours and a bucket of bricks. And after a while if you practice for that kind of competition, the students realize that there's some ways to do it. You build the base really large and you taper the building up as you go. But it's a competition. And I had a bunch of boys who were competitive as boys will be. <laughs> and they noticed that one of the competing teams was getting close to beating them. 
Uh oh. And they still had time left, unless so they said, well, let's build it taller. The problem was the top of the tower was already only one little brick thin. It couldn't go any skinnier. And they couldn't stack any more on top of it. And the base was fixed and stable. So one of them said, well, let's just put it in the middle. And the two coaches were horrified at this thought. But we had been, we'd been training each other as coaches to let them experience life. If this was a failure, they would learn something important. But, oh, we're so close to winning. They said, okay, guys, what are you going to do? And the boys put together a plan. They decided where to split the tower, what to put in between. And they climbed up the ladder. And two people lifted up the very top of the tower. They inserted this middle section of the tower with minutes left in the competition and won. Oh, wow. wow. The tower was, they, they put it in, smacked it down, and it was stable and stayed. And they backed away when time was called, and they had the tallest tower. Oh, wow. But they did it by putting extra bricks in the middle. On the middle. <laughs> well, that's crazy. Yeah. But it worked. Interesting. And that was the winning idea. Uh, there was another competition where we had robots competing in a, a field that was set up with obstacles and ping pong balls. And the object was kind of like a, a soccer game and kind of like, I don't know, not a sport you play with people, but go around and maybe stop another robot from happening, but you get more points if you pick up the ping pong balls and deposit them in your corner bucket. And so my team wow. decided we need to build a claw for a robot that we can control remotely. This wasn't autonomous control. This was a remote control kind of a thing. But they built a claw that had an elbow and a shoulder and a claw joint. They could pick up a ping pong ball and then drive the robot over to the bucket and drop it in the bucket. Yeah. And they did that okay a couple of times. Yeah. But their side of the field had no more ping pong balls left on it. So the driver had to get to the other side of the, the playing field, which had obstacles in the way. There was a mine, well, a field of things that robots that are made of little tiny Legos have a hard time crawling over. Oh, and he got up to the, what he thought was the simplest obstacle and he got stuck. And I don't know where the idea came from, but I watched him put the claw down in front of the car and he used the claw as a fifth foot. And he used the claw to lift up. He put the claw on the ground oh. the way tractors do now that I've seen oh, and yeah. lifted the vehicle up off the ground with a claw and overcame the obstacle stepped over it he, and it was amazing because that wasn't what the claw was designed for wow but they had built it strong so that it wouldn't collapse when they used it and he realized that was a use for it yeah and we did well in that competition the next mm -hmm. time we met together as a competing group everybody's team had a claw on their car every one of them <laughs> they thought that is such a powerful idea we want that too they weren't even sure how to do it we didn't have yeah. diagrams and they didn't even have a plan they kind of made it as they went but that innovation was so powerful yeah. He used something for one use, and he used it to literally overcome obstacles. That's what I see robotics doing for people. They have a chance to describe to a machine what they want it to do, and they have to be very specific. But then once you have a good tool, you can do amazing things. And when you have that freedom to let the mind run, or maybe the pressure of competition, just the right amount of pressure, and the brain comes up with these new ideas, these creative critical thinking, problem solving looks at the world. I like that what science can teach, one of the cool things about it in a K-12 setting is that you have these opportunities to fail and you yeah. learn from each of those experiences. Um, so whether you figure out that the claw is a tool and it's gonna help you or whether you mess up and it falls off, right? Right. Every failure you're teaching is an opportunity to try something different, do better. And it's just neat that they get to do that in that safe environment and fail and then try again and learn from those experiences before they go out into the world. Yes, <laughs> no, that's valuable. <laughs> and one of the reasons I use the tools that I do is because they're reconfigurable. They, when the robot falls over and falls apart, I said, it's just Legos, they come apart anyways. Take it apart, put it back together. Let's try something else. Because that is, that the failure is an important part of learning. To be totally honest, the courses that I teach, mm -hmm. physics and math, are the ones that I got both A's and F's in, in college. I flunked a physics class, had to take it twice. I flunked a college algebra class and had to take it twice. So yeah. I can tell my students, I know the angst of praying for a C minus and hoping that you get enough points to pass. But I also know the confidence of, I've understood this. I see how this works, I can apply, I can answer the question. And so I think that's a useful tool to me as a teacher, to be able to tell them that failure is not the end. That's the time when you really get to learn something. When things don't work, we look for things that make them work. And I think that's a core um, idea or experience that we need to have in the American classroom is to, is to know that you can have the freedom to try and fail and innovate, right, without um, 
but but I guess by learning that that's the process. Yeah, it is. Pro- that's a process of progress, and not just in an academic setting, but that's just a simulation for innovation, whether it's in business or in music or you know whatever your application is in life. And this, and I like how you're just—it's not about the Legos or the labs or the science. Right. It's about the human development. That's that's very impressive, Jeff. I love that. Um, so I had a very inspiring ph- physics teacher and I felt like when we were studying, a lot of the physicists were male. And then I had a female physics teacher in high school and she was so cool. And she was even like seven months pregnant, I felt like for the entire semester, which is oh. impossible. <laughs> she just was very, that's what your memory very is. pregnant for the entire <laughs> semester or year. Um, and anyway, she was fantastic and she inspired us to be super curious about the world around us and to try to apply the things that we were curious about. And so I think that's what kind of hooked me. I love studying science. In fact, I study quantum physics in the morning, which is a weird thing for somebody who doesn't work in science. That's a good thing. Though. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> wow, it's wake like you up. That's better little than coffee. Bits, I know little, little <laughs> bits every day. It's been a couple of years and I'm still like an infant in the topic, but I just am so curious and I feel like it was these really cool, inspiring teachers who gave me an interest and kind of propelled me. And I see that kind of in my kids too, they might not be interested in something. And then they have this great teacher and all of a sudden they're fascinated and curious and learning and, it's just awesome. I love hearing stories from teachers. Um, so if you have any stories to share, I'd love to hear how things that you've taught in your classroom have inspired students to maybe try something a little bit beyond. Do you have any of those? I do. It's kind of nice as a teacher to get feedback from students after they've graduated. And I have a little file of when I'm having a bad day, I open these <laughs> up because here's somebody who said, that thing you taught me was so useful. A really simple one was when I was teaching an algebra class, I taught them a song for the quadratic formula. And it was to the tune of Frere Jacques. I said, you can just hum this to yourself. Now remember it. And this girl who was really good at things said she was taking a placement test in college in the testing center. And she got to the math problem about the quadratics. And she started humming the song. And people around her looked. And she said, sorry. <laughs> and, but she aced the entry test. Yeah. She said, that helped me get past the questions I was the most worried about. <laughs> um, I had another student who went to ASU after he graduated from, here, from Heritage Academy. And he came back to tell me. Here's a picture that I took that I want to give you, Mr. Burl. What is it? This is the, it was the current Mars rover at the time that because of the classes he was taking at ASU, he was involved in the lab and he got to control the rover for just a moment, yeah. 20, you know, on Mars and decide what rock to take a picture of. And he showed me that. Oh, wow. That wow. was so fulfilling to think, oh, I remember helping you figure wow. out mm-hmm. how, you know, that's the scientific me. method, observe, hypothesize, experiment. That gave me chills. That has to feel so good as a teacher. It was so right? cool. And I said, he got a picture of another planet. Wow. Um, wow. I had a student a couple of years ago whose dad came and he said, well, let me give you something. And they gave me a poster that I hang on my classroom door. And it's the Perseverance rover with ingenuity, the helicopter and the, the ground rover, which is an amazing piece of creative technology that we learned incredible things. And... They weren't even sure it would work when it got there. Nobody had ever flown a drone on Mars. And it would have to be crazy teenage boys that have flown drones when they weren't supposed to in ways in a storm (laughs) or on Earth when they were doing something that was on the fringe of acceptability. They would think, how can we develop something to fly in a smaller atmosphere and no repair work available? If it crashes, we're done. And the Ingenuity helicopter lasted an amazingly long time. And we did gather real great information. And now that's not a project that I had a finger in, but I got feedback on that that thinks, right. well, this this is working. I have another student who grew up and has kept in contact with me that went to ASU and said, wow, you got me so interested in reading classics that had the truth, the old books, that I kept doing that. And now after science class and critical thinking class with him, he's working at Intel on the next chip that's coming out. He wrote me, in, and he couldn't tell me what it was because non-disclosure agreements, but it's the next chip we're going to hear Intel putting out there on the market. Mm-hmm. And he said it was, I learned how to think, and I learned not what to think, but how yeah. to think. Yeah. And that, that was really cool. That made me feel really valid. And I've had a couple of students who are in fields that don't sound like science that have expressed how those ability, that, that ability to think critically mm-hmm. and to come up with a new idea has been useful. Even one was a a mom who said, I got my kids to eat their sandwiches better because you told me about isosceles triangles, that they make the best sandwiches because the crust to sandwich ratio is minimized (laughs) if you have a 45, 45, 90 triangle. And they said, you're right. Those kids would eat the whole thing on their plate and not complain. 
mom, cut them the yummy way. It, you know, it's the same sandwich. Yeah, but. No. <laughs> That's me. Uh, I love that. And, and Jeff, I like so I like the, that you use the word truth. And you're not afraid to use that. You've, you've dropped that a couple of times. And it, it reminds me of um, a lesson I learned on the state board that's that's been with me for a long time. We updated the science standards for Arizona. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they came forward with is that they were recommending to drop, they, the state agency, were recommending to drop um, the emphasis of the teaching the scientific method. Mm. Yeah. And <laughs> Sorry. Something that was about, a legitimate grunt. <laughs> I'm a business major. I'm not a science major. And I was like, what? I mean, I like science. Um, I'm one class from being highly qualified to teach science. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to ask. I've got two brothers that are very, um, very qualified engineers and then we also have scientists on on the staff at Heritage Academy. Yeah. One of them, as you might remember, Dr. Grimm. Yeah. I mean, he helped map the whole human DNA in the genome project in Phoenix, Arizona. Right, right. And I said, I'm just going to ask around and see, because the state agency people revising the standards were saying, well, we're using these new standards because the old standards are passe. That, that was effectively the meth, the message. And I thought... Well, maybe. I don't know. I, have, I haven't really been in a lot of science education lately. It's been about 10, 15 years. So I started, I emailed my brothers, you know, one one runs the strategy office at a in New York City. He did startups in Silicon Valley, he created the fastest database in the world at the time. Oracle loved it so much, they bought it. So, I mean, these are serious engineers, right? Flash memory um, yeah. architects. I mean, these guys know their stuff. I, so I said, Hey guys, um, do you guys still use a scientific method in, in engineering in your space? What are you saying? And their responses were, um, they're like, I, I said, that's this, I described the whole thing. I said, the state agency says there's more current tools and thinking processes that we should be emphasizing in our classroom and the scientific methods, you know, a little bit dated. I go, what do you think about that? And they said, well, listen, there's no question that there's new tools in and we are using those and we're excited about new tools. They said, and, and we use those maybe once a week, a couple of times a month. And we're, and we're excited about those. And, and you should educate people on the new thinking models, but the scientific method is just foundational. It's while well, we use those a couple of times a week, we use that a couple of times a day. Yeah. And, and it's just foundational. And then I asked the scientist, I said, what's your feedback on this? You, you've looked at this from a scientific standpoint rather than an engineering application standpoint. And his feedback was, he said, you know, a lot of these new thinking models are helpful, they're useful, but they're just not as structurally um, proven for the purposes of discovery of truth. He says, some of these thinking models that are coming in are good for very small purposes, but not those foundational purposes of, of science. He goes, and the other thing, the dark side is these, because they're sort of lighter thinking yeah. models, are used for um, political purposes or m purposes to land federal grants or twist things, because that model won't test out or, or surface as much as you know, the, the scientific method is going to prove. There, there's a role for them. We're not saying don't use them, but yeah. they're being twisted for purposes that are just not fundamental to the discovery of truth. And I thought, oh, wow, that's interesting. So anyways. That, <laughs> so that word truth is important to me. In fact, when I talk about the rules in my classroom, that's the first rule of my class. And the kids, when they hear, what are your rules? I say truth. They're ready for a rule like don't talk when it's not you. But, and that's important. But my first rule is truth. Because if it's not about truth, I don't think it's about science. It's something else. And my second rule is trust. If you don't have the truth, you have to decide who and what you trust. Yeah. And if those two things don't work together, you can't progress as a human. We can't progress as a culture or a society. There's a difference between truth and fact, for example. When I teach my classes, I say it used to be a fact that there were seven known planets in our solar system. And when you looked it up in the textbooks in the 1920s, it would list the known planets of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and then just barely newly Neptune. Okay, Neptune's the 1800s, but in those books. And in the 1920s, that was it. That was the answer to the question, how many planets are there? People had dreamed of other planets around other stars. Nobody had ever seen one. No scientist had ever had any evidence other than it makes sense there should be because there's so many stars. But in, the in 1930, 
a rogue astronomer here in Arizona, Clyde Tombaugh, looked through his telescope through some special devices and said, wait a minute, there's another one. Mm -hmm. And he was the one who discovered the planet Pluto mm -hmm. and up at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff. And that changed things. So by about 1935, you'd read a science book for high school or elementary school even, it said these are the nine planets in the solar system. It would say the nine planets, mm -hmm. and they'd be listed in order. By the time I got to high school in the middle 80s, somebody noticed that for a while, Neptune seemed further away than Pluto did. And so they said, okay, let's change what the book says now. It's Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Uranus, Nep and sometimes Neptune and sometimes Pluto. Oh. <laughs> it had to flip. And, some, and the, as students, we'd say, okay, teacher, you're always telling us these absolutes. We thought they were pulling a fast one on us. Which one is it? Teach us the real truth. Yep. And the truth was Pluto's orbit was different than the other planets. We didn't know this because from 1930 to 1985, we'd only seen a couple of decades of that planet's orbit. If we assumed it was like the others, which was not a bad assumption to make because Johannes Kepler, centuries before, had put together the rules of planets orbiting, and he figured out the math and said, this is the way all the planets seem to orbit the sun. And they kept expanding those to the new discoveries. When they put those ideas around Pluto, it told us where Pluto should be for an entire 250-year trip around the sun. Well, 35, 50 years into that time, we hadn't all the data that we needed to know that Pluto had a much wider mm -hmm. orbit in one dimension, but a narrow orbit in another direction. Its orbit was tilted a little bit and a funny shape. So its distance from the sun sometimes is shorter than the distance from ne the sun to Neptune. Mm -hmm. That's just the truth. It's not what people accepted. And I tell my students, this is an example of the difference between fact and truth. We thought the truth was there's seven, eight planets. And then they said there was something else. Everybody had agreed that there was eight planets, and so that was what was accepted. And I call that a fact, yeah. a close agreement by competent observers. They weren't idiots. Mm -hmm. They just didn't know. When they found Pluto, we didn't change the truth. People would say we rewrite physics every time the James Webb Space Telescope finds a new protostar <laughs> or something. We're not rewriting the truth. Right. We're expanding our perspective of it. We're yeah. rewriting the facts, the things people agree on. And the things that we're learning. And the th like yes. the new information that we're learning. Yeah. Yeah. It, I think it's a, it's appropriate for an educated American to realize to, you, you need to live in a world of knowns and unknowns. Absolutely. And, and that's what I hear you say. Um, and I'm with you. I'm not a Pluto denier. <laughs> I've been it's a little a observatory. <laughs> yeah. The piece of rock has not changed since we reclassified it. <laughs> exactly. If we have any Pluto deniers listening to this podcast, just know Sorry, that. Sorry. That's where I stand. Uh, we love we love Lowell Observatory and, and encourage you to go there. And Only you, state in the United States that's discovered a planet. That's, that's right. <laughs> in our solar system. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, that, 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 that's what educated Americans need to know is it's okay to believe in truth yeah. because there is truth. If there isn't truth, then you have to except that there's absolutely no absolutes, which is ridiculous on its face, right? And science, like science isn't settled, right? Like my, no. I, you know, my sister went to Yale, it, she delivers babies, she's so smart, she learned like the best information out there when she graduated, right? Within just a few years, procedure guidelines had changed based on studies, based on what they'd been doing and trying that they thought was the best. Well, maybe that didn't provide the best outcomes. So, right, so you change as you learn new information. And so whether it's in, yeah, if you're putting something on Mars or if you're delivering a baby, like you really have to constantly be learning and not just be like, well, that's what I learned 20 years ago. Right. Yeah. If you look at the shape of SUVs now, it's funny to me that if you were to take a brand new line of SUVs from seven different automobile makers and strip off the logos, mm -hmm. so you just had the basic white metal model. Okay it would be hard to tell them apart from yeah. each other other than a tail fin here or a bumper change here because over the decades of engineers trying to design the most energy efficient, big enough to house a family, but least drag coefficient and best use of fuel and engine space, they came up to a similar conclusion. Mm -hmm. To me, that's evidence of that thinking process going, well, if they thought about it hard enough and long enough, mm -hmm. the best solution for that set of parameters, it's got a, not a race car, it's a passenger car mm -hmm. and it has to go around town and it's going to kind of boil down to that same shape. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's because people didn't know. And if you looked at the dream of future cars back in the 50s, we would draw pictures of race cars of the future, and they would have a certain shape that we would draw as kids. And nobody's car is shaped like that anymore. Not even Elon Musk's innovative <laughs> stuff. It, you know, that just didn't work when we really got down yeah. to it. And in medicine, 
Things have changed like that over the times. Um, what people used to think about germs, and now we understand about microbes and, and microbiology, it's just completely different. What people think about even government, when we talk about that the Constitution of the United States was formed after the Founding Fathers got together and looked at a bunch of failed and successful governments of the past. I think there was a science experiment there. And the way I teach the scientific method, there's four parts to it. You can pick up a textbook and you can have a book that says the six parts of the scientific method, the 17 parts, but there seem to be four basic parts. It's you make an observation, you notice something. You hypothesize or you ask a question, say, oh, that's funny, I wonder how come. Mm -hmm. And then you do a test. You go gather information, you experiment, you try something and keep track of what happens. And if it doesn't work, you don't hide your results. Mm -hmm. You admit it didn't work because that's not failure. That's telling you your original hypothesis was not the real connection between the observation and the things out in nature. Then you draw a conclusion. And the conclusion isn't the end. You said, Lindsay, science isn't settled. Heavens no. I, I, and I hope people realize that. During the COVID shutdown time when people would say, just follow the science, I wanted to scream at the TV. And if they said that one more time, I probably would have thrown something at the TV because they made it sound like it was something that was already done. Science is what we do now. And if you could follow anything, it would be those steps of thinking and saying, well, what do we know? Do we really know that? And it's hard to get people to do that sometimes. We're comfortable with our misconceptions because they worked. Yeah. Even as little children, uh, trauma recovery coaches will tell you that children in traumatic situations, they get wrong ideas about who they are and how life is because it's the only way to make sense of their own personal needs, their little tiny child brain, and the environment that they're in, that they receive that abuse in. It's, it's what we do is we try to make connections, even if they don't really hold water. I was babysitting my siblings once. I'm the oldest of five kids. And it, my parents found a free babysitter in me after a while. And so I was watching <laughs> the kids and it was a thunderstorm outside. And my siblings were very scared because it was one of those Arizona monsoon thunderstorms that turns from a dribble of rain into immediate thunder clouds and shaking the windows and, and then it's gone again. But during the window shaking time, my little brother said, oh, I'm so scared of the storm. And in my trying to think on my feet as a babysitter, I thought, we've got to dispel this fear right here. I know, I'll tell him a story. And because I'd read some Greek mythology and consider myself an expert on that at the time, I knew that it wasn't Zeus. Well, I didn't think it was, but I made up a story for him. I said, oh, this will help him feel better. That's not really the storm. That's giants up in the sky bowling. Because we all know from Jack and the Beanstalk that giants live on top of the cloud. Of course, yeah. And so that's just what a giant bowling. Do? And he goes, oh, that does sound like a bowling alley. See, it's okay. And then he said, wait a minute. When I bowl, the bowl goes in the gutter all the time. What happens when the bowling ball rolls off the clouds? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've created a new problem. That wasn't a good solution. But... I thought that was an idea. Where, That's funny. But, That's but it, I tried to draw that connection. and it You're more hold. creative babysitter than I am. We <laughs> were in about the storm. I was babysitting and lightning struck our house. Oh, no. My parents were gone. I was not so creative. I was well, like, everyone stay calm. I'm calling mom and dad. <laughs> mine ended up at that after a while. <laughs> wow, that's exciting. We have to hear about that sometime. Yeah. Oh, it, but we make connections. And I, as a science teacher, part of my job is to handle misconceptions carefully, but to debunk them. I spend most of the school year debunking and then supplying with better information and a chance to discover something truer. In my ninth grade science class, I asked them to tell me about what a day is. What's a day? And they look at me like I'm nuts. This is, <laughs> this is so easy, that's a hard question. And somebody timidly raised hand gets 24 hours? I said, how do you know that? Well, because it is. How do you know? Um, and they'll come up with some adult who's told them that. Yeah. How do they know? I don't know. Someone told them that. <laughs> and so it's tradition is what I say. Well, no. And they're not ready for me to call that tradition. And it almost sounds condescending. And for a moment, I let it sound that way. But then I say, well, that's not bad. But how do we know that's the truth? And someone else will think, okay, let's switch the discussion, Mr. Bro. We'll see. A day is from sunrise to sunset. Oh, got it. What's sunrise? Well, when the sun comes up over the horizon. I said, you're 14 years old. Do you think the sun comes up over the horizon or does the earth turn? <laughs> oh. Yeah, well, that's right. And we start to look at that. And I don't take those things away from them and give them something else. I said, why don't you go watch the sun rise and see if it really happens? Oh, that's too early. Well, in August, it might be. In December, this would be a really easy assignment. And they immediately say, oh, yeah, it would be. They know that the sun rises at different times of the day. 
at different times of the year. And so it's fun to help them connect the things that they know to conclude something that's much easier to handle. The sun doesn't rise. The earth spins. But unless you've ever been on a merry-go-round as a little child and spinning around on your little horse in the merry-go-round and thinking your parents are walking away from you and coming back, but they're not, you don't realize that you can have a change of perspective that redefines everything for you. That's amazing. That, no, I, I love that. Those are great stories. <laughs> I wish, I wish uh, you were my physics teacher uh, once upon a time. That's, that's, that's wonderful sometimes to learn I, from you. Sometimes I pop in too, so I get to help with some oh, social you? media. Oh, fun. And yeah. sometimes if, yeah, if Mr. Earl's class is out in the foyer or I'll pop in and do a recording and it's fun to see whether it's an egg drop off of the top of a building or a spinning wheel. Um, it's really fun to capture these little little moments I and have then to be honest Lizzie. always when I post those everyone's comments are we love us tomorrow oh. you're a favorite <laughs> that was my first time as a media star was you posted me doing a bicycle oh. tire thing my sister my, my daughter Watch came out home for the from paparazzi her. she goes you're famous now Dan I said I know I just wish we were rich and famous we're still not rich yeah but that's okay we're fine financially but no Lindsay those times you popped out like that have been encouraging to me because it's good for me to see people value that aha moment that is so rewarding as a teacher. That's one of the reasons I teach. I told that teacher back at ASU a long time ago, I teach because I want to help. Mm-hmm. I like helping people. It feels good. That's why service is a part of so many. It's an important part of everything. But there's something nice and satisfying about having someone realize, oh, this is the truth. We did it at a lab one time where I have these uh, clear acrylic plates with stripes painted on them at regular intervals. And they're... Um, you drop them through a laser timer gate. And it, the lab is to discover the rate of acceleration of gravity, Earth's gravity. Mm-hmm. And I was setting up the equipment the day before and making sure it was calibrated and working right. And I dropped the, the thing through and I got the wrong number. Mm-hmm. 10 times in a row I got the wrong number. I thought I just broke gravity. Because if I was really looking <laughs> at the things I thought, I could not get the number I wanted. And as I sat there trying to get the number I wanted, I realized, oh, Jeff, that's exactly what you tell that's your students not to do. <laughs> you need to see what's going on. Did you make a mistake in measurement? Is the number you thought was the truth? Is that not the truth anymore? Mm-hmm. Or was it never the truth? And we just didn't understand. I found the problem with the equipment. There was a crooked laser gate, and it was making the readings wrong. Because when the students set it up according to the instructions that I had been using, they got the right number the next day. I didn't tell them I made all those mistakes. I was saving that in case they did to help them feel better about not being perfect. But they came up with exactly the right numbers. And I walked over there without admitting my ignorance and said, so how did you guys do that? Well, we did it just like this, but we found this was wobbly. So we t- twisted the screw a little bit oh. tighter and the laser gate stayed stable and it dropped through. And I said, that's genius, guys. Good work. Nice. Later on, years later, Red Bull did a commercial where they took a man, Felix Baumgartner, up into the stratosphere. And he didn't jump out of a satellite, but he fell. Because if you watch the video feed, this guy looked a little bit too scared to jump any higher than he already was. <laughs> but I watched this video feed from the live moment of the, of the balloon off the ground up into the air and then him coming down. And he fell faster than the speed of sound in a wow. spacesuit, wow. which was incredible stuff and makes for good Red Bull commercials. Yeah. <laughs> but... What was really neat to me was they were tracking at the same time all of his statistics. So on the YouTube video, there was a picture of him falling, and there was these meters on the other side measuring his distance from the satellite, his distance toward the surface of the Earth, the time he'd been falling, the speed he was reaching. And I said, oh, wait a minute. This is a physics teacher's dream. Wow. Because he was falling under the influence of gravity only for a while. And I kept track of the numbers, and I took the video. I made a copy of the video to leave my computer, and as I took it apart and made several measurements, it exactly matched the acceleration due to gravity that every science teacher knows they need to get their students to understand. 9.8 meters per second squared to the second decimal place. Wow. And it was just some daredevil falling through the sky with a spacesuit on. And I showed that to the students. I said, what do you think? Wow, that's real. There was no way to fake that. We watched him go up in the air. We, there's no cut away from the camera. We see the whole thing happening. And that must be the truth. And it will be for me until we discover something else about it. But for yeah. now, that satisfies all my questions, and that's undeniable proof. You can go talk to that man, I suppose. He probably n- Probably nobody likes the ground like that guy does now, watching him land after <laughs> falling faster than sound. And How long did it take him to reach ground? You know what? I don't remember exactly. It wasn't as long as you'd think. We talk about the space shuttle or yeah. some rocket going up, and we wait a long time. He came down pretty fast. Oh, really? And he wow. did have a parachute at the end. Yeah, wow. That's amazing. But... When he got to the ground, he 
he kind of looked like he was worshiping the ground or praying or something. <laughs> he was really enjoying being on the ground. I bet. But it was because he just experienced something. You cannot tell oh, him bet. anything other than what he experienced. And that's one of my, there's a quote that I heard once that has been re-paraphrased so many times. I'm not sure who to give the credit to, but a man with an experience is never at the mercy of someone with an opinion. Hmm. When you know you've had it happen, yeah. I know that's the truth. Jared, I have had a couple of your daughters in my physics classes in the past, yeah. and they had an assignment where they had to find the moon. And I, I tell that. these juniors and seniors, you're going to go find the moon. They roll their eyes and go, we did this in fifth grade. <laughs> okay, this should be easy then. And during the first week of school, which is you know July or August for us now, it's easy to do. But within two weeks, they can't find it. And when they come back to class, they say, we couldn't find the moon. I do that thing that teachers do when somebody steals somebody's lunch. Okay, lock the door. Everyone, we're empty. Over all your backpacks. We're going to find who took the moon. Who stole until you put the it moon. back on my desk right now. <laughs> and they help. What are you crazy? To dress but, up like Gru. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, so why couldn't you find it? I looked all night. My parents were so mad because I didn't go to bed. Well, who said you had to stay up all night? It's the moon. So you think the moon comes up at night? Of course. Why do you think that? I don't know. It just is. Have you never seen the moon up at lunchtime? And usually in a class of 25 to 30 kids, one person will say, oh yeah, how does that happen? <laughs> the moon's up in the daytime. I don't know, I didn't do it. And so we, th their thought that the moon only comes up at night is now challenged. I say, well, let, let's watch it for a full cycle and see what happens. And the learning that happens is the beginning of the school year where they start to see, realize when something doesn't make sense, you don't just toss it out or only resort to tradition, but you gather evidence. And after watching it for a full cycle, they know that the moon doesn't just change position in the sky. It changes rise and set times. And sometimes it is up in the daytime. And sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it faces one way. If you look at a crescent moon, some of them look like a capital C, mm. and some of them are curved the other way. Mm. And that's because the shape of the moon that we see is related to its position relative to the Earth and where the sun is and how long it's been going. And it's a wonderful chance to say, here's where that math they've been teaching all those years comes into play. Your geometry, your algebra two is needed to describe this phenomenon that you can observe by just waiting until it shows up. It's not hard to yeah. go find it. You just gotta know when to look. Oh, that's Put mind hard. a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and how do you know when to find it? Well, I've watched it a bunch of times. I know there's a pattern. When my younger students have to find the sunrise, how do you know what happens? Well, I personally have watched the sunrise many, 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 many mornings in a row. I know that it comes up in different parts of the sky on different days. I know that it comes up at different times. I know the colors of the sky change in a certain pattern every single time the sunrise happens. And I ask the students, do you think the colors of sunset are the same as the colors for sunrise? And the ones that have been catching on to what it means to discover truth will say, oh, I'm going to look. That pleases yeah, my heart. Yes, great. you go look. Yep. And what do we need you for? Comes up. I said, you don't. <laughs> if this is working, you will not need me by the end of the year because yeah. you'll be so motivated to go and discover. And you'll have the basic tools of think. Think carefully. Ask a question and be willing to follow through with what that question's answers are. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. The founding fathers that said, this is the kind of government we need for a successful country, did that because they drew a conclusion based on other failed systems mm -hmm. and other successful systems. And they amalgamated the best ideas together yeah. to put something together that other nations have copied since. George Washington literally called it the science of government. He said it's the primary objective for young people to learn. Well, and I, I have heard that yeah. quote. And so when I teach the scientific method, I'm careful to choose words yeah. that can fit into any discipline. When you observe, hypothesize, experiment, conclude, that can happen as you analyze To Kill a Mockingbird in your English class. That can happen in your government class when you look at the pendulum of power between anarchy and monarchy. That can happen in any setting where you're going to learn something. Someone will inevitably say, well, what about religion? I said, what about it? Well, religion and science don't mix. I said, then you really haven't read about the first scientists. Yeah. Gregor Mendel was a monk. Galileo was employed by the state, which was the church. There, there is plenty of men and women who looked at things critically. Isaac Newton wrote so many books about science that we're aware of, but he wrote a lot of things about religion. He studied his religious curiosities 
with the same fervor and rigor that he studied math and science. It's integrative thinking. It, and as he looked, and he was willing to accept evidence without excluding any evidence. You have to consider what's relevant. Yeah, known and unknown. And that's the point. You, you take what you know to figure out what you don't know. I want to ask you one more question here before we wrap up. Talk to me about how you um, approach p- people that say, well, yeah, but I don't, I'm not really a scientist. I'm more of a, I like to read, and I'm more of a literature person, right? How, how do you help science come to life for those that don't see themselves as inclined to math and science or the STEM uh, areas? Let me answer that with a definition. When people talk about STEM, uh, that's, an ab- that's an acronym, and sometimes the word is STEAM, but it stands for science, technology, engineering, sometimes the arts, and mathematics, and all those things put together. Well, that's what life always has been. When I was a little kid, that's how we learned in school, was by experimenting with things, and we, we tried some things out. When a person thinks they're good at reading and not at math or science, I try to help them find where the things they're good at are already a part of what they have left to learn. Um, there's the issue of growth mindset versus fixed mindset, and that's at the core of my reason for approaching them that way. But I said, we need good readers for science. We need to know what didn't work before. In fact, let's go read Isaac Newton's book about the laws of motion. Because most people will say, you guys can finish this sentence for me maybe, for every action there is always equal reaction. An equal reaction. That's what everybody says. Did you know that's not what Isaac Newton wrote? No. Oh. <laughs> that isn't what he wrote. First of all, he wrote it in Latin, so it wouldn't have been in English. I saw it on the internet. It must yeah. be true. Well, so many people say that, but he didn't actually say it that way. It's much longer. He said, for every action, and the best English translation goes, there is always opposed an equal reaction. Now there's a semicolon because it's longer. Or the mutual actions of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed to contrary parts. Mm-hmm. And my students think, wait a minute, that's more than we thought. Yeah, that's the truth. That's what Isaac Newton wrote. And he wrote it because he repeatedly tested things. And this was the best sentence he could come up with to describe the relationship between the objects he touched the measurements he made, and his perception of the universe. And unless you travel at the speed of light or into the quantum realm of our Marvel Comics movie things, those rules work. Mm -hmm. Someone would say, well, Einstein proved Newton wrong. Well, Einstein's difference with what Newton thought only happens at near light speeds. Mm -hmm. And nobody's ever been that fast. So for practical life, consumers, voters, parents, children, those are the rules. And philosophically they hold there too mm-hmm. for every time there's a good act there yeah. is a there's a bad that exists yeah well i know my daughters that you that took your class and and just loved it they are not going into the sciences um but they use that body of knowledge in what they write and and, and so they see the applicability in other areas even though so it's more of a means not an end for them absolutely but it's still a meaningful and substantive part of their life and um, I, I guess my point is I always like to hear how people approach those that aren't naturally inclined to, to these uh, because that every, the, the American education has to be full of science, not just yes. in a particular uh, you know, 60 minute period, but that mindset has to permeate because it's, it's about discovery. It's about understanding. It's about figuring out you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> And being okay with that. There's so many lessons besides learning certain particular laws that are applicable. And as part of an entire educational system, science is an integral part, but so is math. Math is the course where we learn how to handle truth. We don't think about it that way when we memorize our multiplication tables. But do you realize how true it is that 3 times 5 is 15? That's true even when it rains, or even if some other office of president is, you know, that's always true. In math, we get the chance to handle absolute truth, and we get good at it if we succeed at math. In reading and English and language arts, we learn how to communicate. If a scientist discovers something and cannot communicate to the world, nobody knows it, and they will never know that it happened. We must be communicators. We need to understand history, because we need to know what's happened before to avoid repeating the same mistakes and to build on what was done before. When the Revolutionary War dust settled, the next president of the United States said, we're gonna stabilize things so that the arts and the sciences can develop later. 
they knew that in wartime you couldn't innovate the way you can when things are peaceful and people have time to now sit down and write poetry yeah. and paint paintings because they're not grabbing their musket and running off to defend their, fan, their homeland. They have time to sit and think harder and deeper. And then you come up with these cool inventions and these beautiful yeah. works of art and these beautiful music and grand things that happen. So we need all of those things together. We need people to learn foreign languages so they can take, as a teenager, the chance to look at something through someone else's eyes which is what you have to do if you're going to learn another language. You have to see it from that culture's point of view. That's a life skill. So we learn in science not what to think, but how to think. And it works with all of those fields of knowledge. Anything you want to learn, you can approach that way, I believe. I love it. No, that's great. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for sharing those stories and experiences and no wonder Lindsay pops in every now and then to take some pictures. And <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome anytime. Get, get some inspiration. Yeah, awesome. You've inspired thousands of, of young people to see science all around them and experience that. And credit to you and, and, and that great legacy that, that you've built. And you're spinning up for what what year is teaching for for you coming up here? I just it? finished teaching my 30th year. Wow. Um, two of those years were at somewhere besides Heritage Academy. I've been at Heritage for 28 years. Wow. Yeah. Because this is Heritage's 30th anniversary, yeah, just, yeah. just kicking off, which is great. So thank you. For, I've seen a lot of things. You, <laughs> you <laughs> it's have. good, though. Well, I, know, I know you've taught at the college as well, yeah. on and off. And um, But thank you for being here. Thanks for sharing the stories. And I hope our listeners will just be inspired, whether you're inclined to math and science or, or not, and however you use it, just to know how fundamental that um, we believe science is to the American classroom, the American education, the experience. If you're inclined to English or history, that's awesome. But you can't teach history without covering science and no. so forth. I mean, it's all it all fits together. And, and our listeners are very educated people, and, and they understand that. And hopefully, they'll be able to see and take away something here for uh, the benefit of their classroom or their children, whoever's listening. And so with that, Jeff, again, thank you for being here. And you're thank welcome. You. It's been a pleasure. And appreciate all of you that have taken your most precious resource to listen to us. And we would encourage you, wherever you consume your podcast, to like and share so other people can benefit from uh, Jeff Burrell's great uh, wisdom and insight on the uh, wonderful world of science and robotics and, and all things of how to think at a, at a higher level to benefit everybody. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Have a great day. Thank you.